increasing our turnout time in the fire stations. So from the time the tones go off to the time the rig rolls out the road. So those are some four major topics. So we spend two weeks at the academy each year, and then you have to write a thesis paper on each one to qualify. So. I'm sure I will. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You very much. At this point, we have uh, some confirmations to take a look at tonight. I am recommending to the council a confirmation. We have uh, PJ Sanchez here. PJ, do you want to stand up? A lot of people know you. Recommending PJ for the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. We have Gulsima Young for Parks and Recreation. I don't know if Tyler made it here tonight. Yep. Well, Tyler's here. OK, good. Tyler Kirchner, who's going to be on the Arts Commission. So these are the recommendations we have here before you. Do I hear a motion to confirm? Move to confirm. Second. second. Move and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Just like that, you're in. So thank you so much for stepping up and volunteering. Rosima is with the Key Club, with the Kiwanis Group, and she's at, uh, at Poland High. And one of the things I've always tried to do is to make sure that we have a high school representative on Parks and Recreation Commission, so important. We also have a college student. We have a number of others in the community. So Cosima stepped up, and we really appreciate that. Thanks so much. All right. And now, next comes another presentation tonight. We have uh, Paul Kimmel from Avista, and uh, will give us a presentation, I think, on the housing study and some other things that are going on with Avista. Timely day, because um, I know they fixed the power outage up on campus, and Vista came through again. Thank you. And if I could just uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, just for the record. Um, so that outage was on our transmission side that fed into the South Pullman substation. A, a switch failed. Uh, so it took a while to reconfigure things, but we should be back up and fixing that permanently. But again, appreciate your patience with us. These are Often it was up on campus. They had lights, so it looks like it worked. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and if I could, Chief Heston, congratulations. Please know how much of this appreciates the work we do with you on that as well. So tonight, um, in spite of what the agenda said, maybe perhaps a little misleading, I wanted to just update you on a, a couple innovative projects that we're working on. Um, you all have packets, and in those packets, a couple things. First of all, an invitation to our Inland Northwest Partners meeting coming up at the end of March. And I have a couple scholarships available if you have some city staff or elected officials that want to take advantage of that. Um, behind that is an updated uh, economic overview of Pullman and WSU, so those two zip codes. So a little more updated information uh, from our friends at EMSI in Moscow. So help yourself with that. If you ever have questions on that, I can run more detail, anything, whether it's industry, demographics, so don't ever t hesitate to call me. But tonight I wanted to just talk with you briefly about uh, what we call Smarter Together, and that is our um, smart meter project. And I wanted to just, first of all, thank you because of what happened here in Pullman some seven-ish, eight-ish years ago, yeah. really laid the groundwork yeah. for us. And again, I think, I think your motto, the high-tech, higher education, and the highest quality of life really, really tied in well to that. Um, they're exciting times for us. Um, and again, I will be talking with you all um, about the, the merger that didn't happen. Um, and we can talk about all the details if you so want to. So again, I'll, I'll reach out to all of you, uh, give you more details there. Um, so again, our AMI, which we call our Advanced Meter Infrastructure Project um, or Smart Meter Project, grid modernization, uh, what we're doing around electric vehicle transportation in Pullman, I believe, Kevin, we will actually have a parking lot sometime this spring that's if the snow thaws. Uh, our Solar Select and the fact that Pullman is a participant and has sub subscribed to that project. Uh, some of the things we're doing in Urbanova and Spokane uh, around the WSU uh, uh, 
um, College of Medicine as well as the University District up there. Very cool, cutting edge stuff. And then right now we are fully engaged in our legislative processes in all five states and uh, especially in Washington around climate change and carbon reduction and how as a utility we balance costs and reliability and the environment and that's continuing challenge but I just want you to know uh, that we do have our customers in mind on that. So again um, the Pullman Smart uh, Grid demonstration project and this is really a, a press release I'll give you a, just a cheat on that uh, this is a, a quote out of that press release that will come out tomorrow uh, but this is Heather Rosentrader she was here last uh, May kind of talking about this project but again she even mentions um, Pullman in this we've come a long way since we installed smart uh, meters in Pullman to create a test bed for learning so again you guys really are the test bed for innovation for us um, so after these many years of planning and the next generation of advanced metering technology, um, we have launched our smart meter project across the state of Washington in our service area. Um, and again, that's a, a, it will be a transformational change for us. This will touch every customer that we have in the state. Um, and it's really the foundation for our smart grid um, and really um, the technology of the future um, going forward. And as you might expect, and I can't, I can't get the video to run, um, but that's okay. Um, you can go out to our uh, Smart Grid um, link on our website and watch the video about smart meters and our Smart Grid project. And it really is, we're not the only utility. In fact, we were kind of cutting edge with the Pullman project, um, but with, then we kind of did a pause because we saw technology continuing to evolve at a much faster pace. Um, so we've rolled this into what we call our grid mod or grid modernization and we're actually doing some investment right now in Pullman and we're trying not to dig up your water mains as we do that work. <laughs> Believe me, trust me, Kevin. <laughs> but again, smart meters are really the utility standard um, of which utilities are going and nearly half of the uh, utility customers in the entire United States already have smart meters. So, so we're a little behind the curve, but um, we'll catch up. Um, so how does this benefit you, really? Um, there are five key buckets here. Again, um, as you saw with the, the smart grid demonstration, project if you so chose to you could have gone through a web portal and gotten near real-time information about your energy use um, and again that will be at your fingertips whether it's your smartphone app um, or a secure website to log into um, you'll actually have more control over your energy energy dollars we can push out information if you so choose um, if you're on a comfort level level billing and you want to manage that bill across a month we can send out reminders like hey it's it's 15 days into this billing cycle and you're at 65 percent of your energy uh, average energy bill that's the kind of information we want to give to you in your hands um, as far as our side and reliability uh, again I think I hope you've already seen some improvements in reliability with smart meters we can dispatch directly to an outage um, and again um, we did a little bit of forensics after the big windstorm of November 15 um, and determined we could have saved outages and improved that by at least 10 percent 10 to 15 percent restored those even quicker if we have the information to pinpoint we can dispatch and again we've already demonstrated that kind of um, reliability um, you'll also have more personalized service so when you call our call centers um, they'll have that information at their fingertips and walk you through whatever question or concern you have and then finally as we see more renewables on our system whether it's rooftop solar um, or projects like LIND will be able to manage and balance that into our system much faster and more reliably. So, so again, lots of benefit. Uh, this is nothing new. This is how it worked before, but again, it's a wireless mesh. Uh, the meter on the side of the house talks to a module on a pole. We already have those out there. You've seen those on our system. That re gets relayed to a central collection point, and then from that, it helps us manage our grid operations, customer service, as well as you have access to that information 24-7 uh, in near real time. I think we're going to be at like five-minute intervals on that. Um, concerns about 
radio frequency are always a, always in, in the, the media, and I can assure you this is not something that we take lightly. Uh, we're concerned about the health and safety of our customers, the security of that information and data as well. Um, just as a comparison here, a smart meter uh, with respect to radio frequency is very much on the low side, um, and we comply with FCC standards. We're using an ITRON smart meter. Again, ITRON is a company that we started some years ago. Uh, there are nearly 9,000 employees, so we're we're kind of partial to them. It's good technology, um, and we hope, as I've been talking to Art Garrow, that we'll be able to leverage that um, smart meter with the smart water meter as well, so we can share some of that um, utility. And again, there's lots of information on our website about that. So in 2018, we did a small phased out project, mostly in Spokane and out at the airport. Um, phase two is what we're launching into now in March of this year. Um, and as you can see down in the lower section there, let me see if I can get the laser somewhere. I don't want to shoot her in the face. Um, anyway, Pullman and, and uh, the Palouse is down in that lower right hand. Um, so we'll be here probably mid mid-May um, installing. So we kind of thought we should probably wait for the students uh, maybe to mostly be gone uh, before we start changing out meters at any great detail. Um, and the way we're contacting our customers, and you may have already gotten an, a notice that, hey, we're launching this project, a 90-day letter, we have a 60-day letter, and then a 21-day letter just to keep you updated. Uh, get out to our website. You can get more information. Um, and then we'll actually day of, we'll knock on doors, we'll leave door hangers, uh, lots of information there as well. There's plenty of information. I left the overview and benefits in your packets as well. Uh, but again, we'll have lots of information out there for customers. So with that, uh, any questions? I want to be brief tonight, but again, follow up with me if you have any questions. Uh, it's myavista.com forward slash smart meters. So. Any questions, comments? I don't have a question, but I can, and I can't speak for every neighborhood, but you guys do such a fantastic job, at least in my neighborhood. And we always know what's going on. When it's a Vista, it's like in the bag. We, we know that, and, and um, we don't have to guess, so appreciate that very much. You're a good community partner. Thank you. With GIS, we can tag elected officials' homes. <laughs> no, I'm just the, the other yeah. part along with that is a Vista has been very proactive in, trim, in trimming trees. And I noticed in California with the problems they had down there, PG&E wasn't. As a consequence, we don't have the outages that they had when all the winds came up and knocked the lines down. So again, I want you, you know, the squirrels are another issue, but yeah. <laughs> but anyway, as far as the tree lines, thank you very much for that work you've been I, doing. I do share with our, our operations people that the mayor of Pullman has a concern about squirrels, and, yeah. and we have squirrel guards, um, and we're very active in putting those up. But we they, do have they a seem very to take care of themselves <laughs> in some of those lines. So. We do have a very active vegetation management, um, and actually, after as a follow-up from the the fires in California, um, which is horrible for both the community and the utility. Um, yeah, we've dedicated even more people to focus on um, how we manage our trees and our transmission right away because it is it is serious business yeah. so thank you I okay. do have, yeah. I do have a comment as well and just to piggyback on what um, Brandon mentioned um, you do take great care of the area and we live kind of Same in neighbor. proximity <laughs> to one another but I do also applaud the responsiveness yeah. of a Vista anytime I have ever called in regard to not a personal problem but a mm -hmm. problem brought forward by you know, uh, uh, someone here in Pullman, um, it's always resolved or answered right away. And I do appreciate that because that helps us as well as it helps your patrons. So I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you and really appreciate the partnership on the, the Relight Washington yes. program and, and Kevin and his staff have been very good about forwarding on concerns from some of your patrons. So. Thank All right. You. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Okay, next comes uh, our district court update. Uh, Adam's been working on this, actually had a meeting today with some of the county people. 
And this is a discussion between uh, the staff and the, the console tonight, and we'll be talking other things a little bit later. So, Adam. Uh, thank you, Mayor Council. So there, there will be uh, two memos that we'll we'll run through tonight in more detail. So uh, Kevin Gardis will cover a memo that details uh, some of the operational costs of the, the current city hall facility. Um, and again, since we haven't decided what the end outcome should be for the use of this building, that does throw a, a, a little bit of a com uh, complex issue into what the ultimate outcome should be with regards to how we treat the district court. The other memo is, is from Ned Warnick, who's uh, working on designing the, the new city hall for us with uh, Design West. He's written a technical memo after reviewing um, the Washington State uh, courthouse standards and put together some of the things that we need to be aware of as, as we go forward with uh, the potential of, of modifying that, that building. So I'll let Kevin first go through his, and Ed can go through his memo, and then as the discussion evolves, jump, jump in with questions, and we'll, we'll all try to answer any questions that you have. Um, there's not a copy of it in the council packet. Um, there is. There's, there is? Yeah. Yeah. In terms of what electronic they have it, and okay. we have some of the printed out, so you have it. I can look through it if you don't have it. I, I know it, so, but you could help fill in the blanks. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so the way uh, the, the memo that I put together, the way it worked is, and I think I mentioned this at a previous council meeting, uh, I looked at government buildings rates and prorated the square footage of, of court and what that would take uh, based on last year's government buildings rates. And it basically works out to approximately $50,000. And so uh, city administrator Lincoln had asked me to just go over what some of those drivers are. So it's just kind of the basics, the utility costs. It's um, electricity, gas, water, sewer, storm, um, it's uh, basic building upkeep, custodial work. Um, we track the hours that bu government building staff spends in each building, so we know how many hours, and then we prorate that out uh, to the different buildings uh, based on how many hours are spent. And then there's a, thank you. And then there's a, um, a third component, which is, kind of what you might consider overhead. Those are the things that are hard to attribute to any one category. And then we prorate those out based on how many hours government building staff spend in each city building the previous year. So that's kind of the basics of it. Um, and I think the memo goes into a little bit more detail into the, the individual costs that kind of make up some of those, everything from maintaining the elevator in City Hall to uh, snow and ice control and that sort of thing so and then there's also basic building maintenance um, you know we typically have a handful of repairs that come up every year some of them are more costly than other years but like you know, replacing the boiler uh, correct. was probably the biggest one we've done um, and there's two other main components of that HVAC system that government building staff have basically done a very good job of um, uh, replacing parts and keeping that system going but at some point it'll be like the boiler it'll just need a complete replacement and then the roof is the other big ticket item for City Hall um, I think the roof you estimated around 300,000 uh, yeah 250 250 to, 300 yeah um, and we had leaks a few years ago where we used to have a bucket by the elevator on the second floor and we got that taken care of but I point that out just to let you know we're just buying a little bit more time on this building until that roof has to be replaced. And um, okay. the power outage today actually alerted us to a leak in the IT room, um, which was fortuitous because we we're able to get that plugged up today before it caused any serious damage. Yeah. So. Questions off of this memo for Kevin? That will present the details. He's got a, a PowerPoint. You all have a, a physical copy of the PowerPoint in front of you as well, if you, if you want to follow along there. So thank you for having me and letting me shine a little bit more light on what was submitted in the, in the council package. Um, my goal tonight is to give you a brief 
briefing, an overview of the implications of district court in the new city council or the city hall building and uh, try to answer any questions that the council might have related to that. Um, so first, to, uh, to give you an idea where, where we're at currently, um, the existing city hall uh, includes 872 square feet of dedicated space that district court uses. This is for offices, reception, um, filing, things like that. And then they share in the use of the hallway, the, the lobby space outside the council chambers, and then council chambers itself acts as a courtroom twice a week. Um, and uh, moving on, Um, if we were to follow current state standards and try to accommodate them in a more uh, correct way according to, to state standards, they'd go from taking about 872 dedicated square feet to about 1,000 dedicated square feet. But then on top of that, they would have a, a larger footprint in terms of shared space. And so their shared footprint moves up to another 17, almost 1,800 square feet. Um, all of this is doable within the new city hall. There, there is ways we can move space around. There will be compromises. There will be space sharing. There will be functional compromises. But it is physically possible for us to find that space and be able to make that come about. Um, the challenges from the state design standards has to do with security. And so security is the, is the primary driver in terms of what the state is looking for in terms of any sort of court facilities. And so um, the, the actual standards, I believe, have been shared with you by uh, Adam, but runs over oh, 30 pages. But the key points that relate to the design of a facility include weapon screening, door security or zoning, the ability to actually separate space within the building, um, providing separate access for judges, potentially jurors or other people that are subject to threat. Um, security zoning so that we can actually put people in different spaces related to the court process. Um, providing greater levels of protection in the sense of bullet resistant materials possibly within the council chamber's desk or spaces such as that. Um, separate waiting areas so that we can take adversarial parties or parties that are in a threatened condition and put them in a safe space. And then at the site level, actually developing areas that can be considered secured parking for judges and other people that may be participating in the court proceedings. Um, the, the telling part of the, the uh, state standards um, I, I did excerpt this quote for this slide. Mixed use buildings create special problems. And in the terms of where the state sees their, their court standards is court safety and court design takes precedence over anything that's in that building. And so if we are to accommodate the district court, then we have to actually accomplish their requirements and then we become the, 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 the trickle down. And there's some benefits to this and there's some costs that are related to us doing that. But a, a courthouse is a specific, is a specialized building, whereas a city hall, and especially a city hall in conjunction with a community center, is really kind of the Swiss army knife of buildings. It tries to be a little bit of everything to everyone. Um, to try to illustrate how this, this impacts the, the potential design of the new city hall, um, on this page, this is the entire first level or the main level of the building. So this is at the upper parking lot level. Um, in the case of the gym building, I'll start from left to right. Um, we have an open space that drops down into the gym, but at this level we also have the preschool classroom and we have the parks and recs uh, administrative offices. Through the connector breezeway into the main building, you can see the council chambers called out and then the public service lobby, which is at the current main entry to what is now the church building. Um, next slide, we zoom in into just the church building, giving you an enlarged view. And so you can see um, the council chambers and the public service lobby. And again, we move in a little bit closer to be able to see the southern portion of the, what is now the church building. Um, the next illustration shows the amount of footprint that the actual district court takes. And you can see it doesn't take a great deal of space in terms of the overall building. It's not a, it's not a huge proportion of the space. It will have significant impact on the function of City Hall. Um, if you can look to the lobby, in order for us to accomplish the weapon screening requirement, um, we would look at taking a good portion of the, uh, the lobby to allow for queuing and, and safety screening. Any of you who have taken a flight can understand how much space that takes. 
rates with TSA. It's a little bit different here, but not dramatically. And so you still have that time lag that takes people to go through weapon screening. The other shaded space to the left of the council chambers would be the areas that would be dedicated potentially to district court. We haven't designed this, but in terms of a footprint, that's the approximate square footage. Um, for comparison's sake, or to, to try to give you an idea of what those spaces would be dedicated without district court, um, the uppermost would be the, uh, the council's flex office, and then we move down into some other office space, storage space, and then the AV support room for the, um, the council chambers. These things can be relocated, these functions can be accommodated in some other way. It's, the, it's just space that there's, it's a zero sum game. We need to move things around to be able to accomplish those things. Um, to give you an idea what the disruption or kind of the control that, that relates to us having court in a building that's not primarily a courthouse, um, the red do not enter symbol show the security zoning that we would need to create in order to set up district court as its own location. And so one of the things that most of you that have much to do with City Hall at all say, well, court doesn't have that much disruption. It's only two days a week and it's part of the day and it's not that, it's not that big a deal. The, the security actually has to be in place any time that district court personnel are in the building. So if we have the judge or if we have the staff that, that do work a 40-hour week, this security zoning would have to be in place. It has somewhat of an added benefit to the city hall and the city, city uh, staff would have that much greater level of security for part of their building. But at the same time, it creates kind of a roadblock between the, the, uh, the synergy or the back and forth that might happen between departments. And so to give you a for example, um, if the director of public works needs to go visit Adam and wants to have a face-to-face -face visit, he'll end up having to go through weapon screening. He'll leave his office downstairs, he'll come up the stairs into, into the, uh, the lobby, go through weapon screening, and then go into the administrative office. Um, there is another option that he could come up the back stairway he'd need to badge in and go through yet another a different security zone to be able to do that. It has some benefits from security purposes, but at the same time it creates a level of disruption in terms of just the con conducting city day-to-day -day business. No, if we had a city council meeting at night and court is not meeting, we'd still have to... No. So if court is not in session or court staff is not in the building, my expectation, this is me as a public office. patron of, of Pullman, I like our small town feel and not, not being worried that I'm going through weapon screening. We would, we would pull the, the metal detector to the side and life would go on as we're, we're used to. But anyone to. coming in for like a building permit would have to go through weapons. So, so the building permit, thing. at least under the current design, you could potentially still go to... Um, Um, you still could go to the public service desk, so these would be outside the security zone, and you could be sent downstairs without going through the, the weapon screening. So portions of city business could be done without needing to go to weapon screening, but other portions uh, would. But if you had to use the elevator, the elevator, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the, elevator the elevator is the challenge, and we can. The, there's some level of well, could we move? Could we move the the weapon screening back until it's just right here? Could we do something different with the doors? Absolutely, we we can work on some of those fine tuning, but regardless of what we do. Um, there is going to be some compromises in terms of the the day to day operations of city business. Um, I'll. Eileen, did you have a question? Well, just sort of, uh, you know, on to that same thing. My thought was about the elevator too. So, but any member of the public coming in to like use the service desk, then should they need to use the restroom? Re have restroom. To go uh, if they need to talk to finance, if they want to come visit Adam. Um, or, or D or any of the kind of administrative things, that means that they'll be going through the security weapon screening. Point. And then I, I think we all have a list here. And then what about the gym portion of the building? So the, the gym portion, let me back up. <laughs> um, the gym portion is available um, without, so there is parking lot out here, which this blue box here is all adequate parking. And so entering parks and rec and registering for class wouldn't require going through weapon screening. Um, the preschool wouldn't require weapon screening. Um, this is kind of a natural, um, I, 
one, one that you wouldn't really want to do is to put a preschool in conjunction with a courthouse. Those are two things that we wouldn't normally want to see combined. And that's but, what the county, when I suggested they take a look at Gladish, that was one of their concerns because the preschool's there, and they said that wouldn't work for them. So. And, and Mayor Johnson, actually, that came up in our meeting today. The court said that they didn't realize that a preschool would be part of, of this building, so they are now aware of that. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly, um, as an attempt to, to try to illustrate this, and these are very simplistic uh, visuals, but this would be the view as you walk in the front door and you're greeted as it is now without having security screening. Um, three public service uh, desks, reception, uh, a clerical work that would go on, um, a hallway that goes back towards the restrooms and the council chamber. When we add the, uh, the addition of weapons screening, we would have to reduce the number of public service desks by, by one, so we would go from three to two stations. Um, we would add the weapons screening, and the part that I can't speak to, but I would imagine is a significant cost, is the cost, is the human resources cost of a security officer. And whether that's a county deputy or some sort of court entity, I don't know, but there is that added cost in, in terms of personnel to be able to actually run these. And the state security guidelines are very clear about the training and the expectations that go along with that. Well, would there have to be a security officer at each screening <coughs> spot? No. So those, the backside, these backside could be accomplished by using badge in ba or FOB, some sort of electronic security access control. Um, so at some point you may bother the judge to the extent that says, well, there's way too many P IT guys running through my space and we need to come up with a different way to try to get that security. But in terms of weapon screening, you only need to do that where there are people generally public, people that aren't pre-screened or have some pre-authorized level to be in that space. And so in this particular diagram, the two left-hand do not enter signs would be some sort of access control door, and then the right-hand one would be the weapon screening that would include a security officer trained to do that. Eileen and then Brandon. Well, I was just thinking, if you have an electronic screening type device, then that means that door is not at all available to the public. Correct. And, and those doors are expensive, and if somebody opens one by mistake, then an alarm goes off, and then we have to have a security response. Correct. Oh, boy. Okay. Brad? So uh, what are we doing right now for security? Um, um, I don't know who. I, I, I believe it's been completely tabled. I think whenever the contract was put together or the agreement that they were going to be located here, one that was 40 years ago and the standards might have been different and I don't think it's been something that's come up since. Um, I also think that the county courthouse is lacking a lot of what the standards would say. They're starting to work on theirs too right they now. They are. Yeah. Um, and my understanding is the way that the court described it today was the representative from the court staff represented today was that as long as you have their interpretation of this was, well, you just have to have a, a plan in place in paper somewhere. I, I, I don't believe that's the interpretation of, of how, how Ned has read these, this document. And I, and I also don't think that we want to not have this conversation. I think it's essential that we have this conversation and look at the standards because I, I believe that all of the liability is going to be on the, the landlord, the city, if, if there is something that, that happens at the court. Um, it, it is something that is, is concerning, especially after reading through these documents about the current setup that we have. Um, as, as I note in the memo that I prepared, the first one, I, I think we're relying a lot on the fact that we've got a police station right across the street with no guarantee that there's going to be an officer available to be present here. The expectation is that those officers are, are tasked with being out on patrol and, and they might be there at, you know, at some point to write reports and things like that. but. Um, we, we aren't meeting the, the standards as, as Washington State Courts recommends them. But they are recommendations. I mean, that it's not statute. It's, it's best practice or yeah. guidelines or? I'm not sure how it's actually written. The, the, the mixed use one had some pretty strong language. It, it's, it's standards adopted by the, uh, the Board for Judicial Administration and Court Security and Committee. It's not, it's not RCW. It's not WAC. It, it's not adopted in terms of a legal legislative process. It is the courts. As the judicial branch, they can operate in a little, 
in a little different world than I think some of the rest. Um, I, I, I agree with what Adam says is that they are standards, they're guidelines. We are operating without this now, but there is a certain level of trepidation under the idea of, well, we're going to give you a courthouse, but it doesn't meet these standards, and we're counting on you being okay with that. And that, that is one possible conversation that could happen with the county. Anne. This might be a premature question, but with all of the uh, effort and expense that goes into this, I haven't seen anything yet in the reading about what is the county's financial responsibility and what is the city's. Everything is the city's going to and the city's going to and the city's going to, but wouldn't the county also be somewhat responsible for some of this expense as well as the court deputy and things like that? That would definitely be the, the, uh, a conversation that still has to take place. I, I agree. <coughs> I, I don't think that it's up to the city to be the, the sole provider. Yes, we're a con contract user, and I think there is a formula that would exist that would allow the city to pay a, a percentage. Uh, again, that wasn't a portion of the, that wasn't something that was bonded for. But yes, I think that there would be a, a certain percentage. Um, we, the conversation that we had today earlier with the prosecutor, we, the, the, of the prosecution costs, 15% of their cost is misdemeanor court, so district court. Of that, we make up 49% of the 15%. So I'm sure there is math that would be able to show how much of a user of the, of the court system we are. Um, I, I, and actually the prosecutor brought it up today too that the way that it would come together would have to be a, a split of some sort otherwise a lot of that would just probably be passed on to us through the cost of operating the, the court or the portion of the court that we use. Do I follow up to that? Yeah. Um, do we know, do we have any precedent or examples of how other municipalities, how their, what their agreements look like? Have we looked at that yet? There, yes, there are plenty of examples. Um, it's a city that has infractions and misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors, is re or has a police force that cites for those, is required to contract with the prosecuting attorney's office and with the jail um, and with the courts to have those um, crimes adjudicated. It, the, the city is not required to have, we're not the county seat. So the only place Correct. that a courthouse is required to be is in a county seat, and that's, that's Colfax. Mm -hmm. um, so most cities don't have a separate court within their city limits. Um, they travel to the courthouse that's in the county seat. Most counties have a single courthouse. Unless they operate Unless, a municipal court. Yeah, right. which, which right. this okay. is not. We, a municipal court would be a separate court formed completely by Pullman. Uh, Pullman would hire the judge, Pullman would hire the prosecutor, Pullman would hire the public defenders, and Pullman would hire the probation officers and the clerks. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Eileen. Yeah, Ned, I realize that, that you know, you've just take, kind, of, kind of taken a first shot at this. It, uh, someone who knows how to read drawings looked at this earlier today with me and suggested could there be a separate court entrance other than having our front door be a fortress? There could be. It would rearrange the space, and it would it would be a more expensive solution than what we currently have. But it's possible; absolutely, it's possible. There is just off the picture here. There is another entry. This could be arranged in such a way. At some point, we cross paths, and and that that's what ends up being the, the challenge in terms of um, unless we were to build them their own restrooms and their own courtroom and things like that. The the economy of bringing them into the it, beyond the the public service. Or the public good of us having a, a central government building for, for the city of Pullman. Um, the, the benefit to this is that it is, even with whatever cost it would cost for us to incorporate court into the city hall, it is less expensive than them building their own court in Pullman or, or potentially their own courthouse, another courtroom in Colfax. So I mean, with it, the rules, they even want you know, a separate restroom for the judge, and they want to make sure their court people are all you know, basically taken away from anybody else and that kind of thing. And I know they're trying to do that right now and trying to accommodate that over Colfax. They, they are. Yeah, but 
it seems like if you had that separate entrance, you just sort of eliminate a lot of square footage that the city would normally be using. Yeah, that's the yeah. disadvantage of that. It, it yeah. does, and we still end up we still end up with having to have the secure zones in order for them to utilize the city council chamber as a courtroom. Other questions or comments? Again, this is our first reading for the, the gathering. As, as the council said, let's gather as much information as we possibly can. It's what we're trying to do. Uh, any other comments that you would like to make from the standpoint of your meeting today with the county in terms of at least they're willing to talk and they came up with some other numbers as far as uh, what the court costs were or something like that? Yeah, I, I thought it was a really great meeting. We, we talked about the primarily the contract for the provision of, of district court and how the city participates with that uh, agreement. And they were able to really well articulate what their cost drivers are, what percentage of, um, of, of the court the, the city uses uh, at the prosecution level, at the uh, jail level, at the public defense level. So it was, it was a good meeting. It was it was more focused on the larger the larger contract. We got a little bit into into this agreement, and uh, I, I mentioned to them at, that the last part of the memo basically suggests that we have a, a study session or workshop of some sort with representatives from the county, both at the staff level and at the elected level, just so we can start to get into some of those questions about what what is their flexibility, what do they have for budget dollars, um, what makes sense for potential locations. Uh, what does it look like if the court is just in Colfax and we need to figure out um, accessibility issues, uh, including uh, buses or, or something like that, a taxi service, something where we're making sure that people can still get to the court and, and is there cost sharing that is involved with something like that too. So I, I, th I think that that would be my recommendation is that we have a further discussion with representatives from, from the county to sort of further flesh out this topic, I would suggest that be the only topic that we we cover that that evening or, or a Saturday morning, but something where it's it's very focused on on this material. Nathan, um, I will say, and I know I was looking at the numbers you provided here, Ned, and appreciate that. Um, looking at your, um, you know, I, not drawings but sketches of what it could be. It, it's really challenging because we want this to be a welcoming environment. Um, this isn't very, you know, this is, this is What's the like one? a, like, like, like a this is an council member, tangle. Uh, McCall said it's, <laughs> it's very much uh, like a fortress there at the front door. Um, however, I, I will also say the amount of people who have talked to me and you know we all serve as as public representatives uh, that's why we were elected um, are very very vocal about the fact that they believe that everything that was coming um, that was going to be in the new city hall would be coming from the old city hall at least in the way of the court and uh, you know so I'm on both sides about this because that is something that our is a major concern and the access uh, many many people um, you know rely on our public transportation and and right now currently that doesn't extend into um, the greater region now perhaps this is starting a better conversation that uh, you know we can have with the county but I will just say those points so and, and I would agree with Nathan. Probably the biggest question that I get about this is we were told that everything that was here would go there, including the district court. And that's the biggest, again, question that I get from, from voters and from people that were involved in this at the, at the outset. We were told everything that we, were, that we had here would go there. So I don't know, I, Nathan. Obviously, you've had those same questions. I don't know if the rest of you have had those. But so Pat, are you are you are you saying that that's what people are telling you? Yes. Is that, okay. Yes. That that the the level of dissatisfaction with what's been going on with the district court is about the fact that we thought it was going to go there, and 
now it's the question is whether it is or it isn't so 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 I'll just mention I I think most of the people that I've talked to um, and I don't mean it to sound negative to say a special interest group are the ones that are are really pushing for this and I agree that we need to um, find every possible way to, to have district court um, here in Pullman right I don't think that's that's the question um, if I talk to most people most people don't don't care I mean they they really they didn't think about it it was an afterthought and, and so I, I feel anyway that um, I don't think the city tried to mislead anybody I think a lot of people feel like they were misled because they've been told they were misled so and I don't I think most people most residents they haven't thought that wasn't in the campaign material at all. It's not in the campaign yeah. material. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. And yes. I don't I don't disagree I yeah. don't disagree with you there at all. And personally, <laughs> that isn't even something that was on my radar screen. Mm -hmm. um, but if there are any questions that are brought to me, it seems to be about about this. So right. that's the only reason Feeling I bring misled. it up. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what. Okay. Sorry, okay. Dan. No, please, Dan. No, I, I think what, what I've been hearing from folks is, is not necessary. And I think I'll restate it a little bit from what you said. I, I don't think I'm hearing from people that they were told the district court was moving. It's that they they weren't told that it that it wasn't moving. Um, they felt like that should have been included if that was going to be part of the move without moving district court. And I think they're they're viewing it more as an an oversight of something that should have been part of the discussion and more prominently if we didn't think district court was moving with the city hall we should have been out front of in, in front of that um, and semantics aside I think uh, one of the things that you said Nathan and, and, and what you brought up Adam about the possibility of transportation if the court was to just, just me in Colfax I have a serious concern about transporting people to uh, to Colfax as a solution to not having district court in Pullman because I think anytime we add another layer of impediment for people accessing court services especially people applying for temporary restraining orders I think it's crucial that we we focus everything we can on finding a solution to keep district court at least in 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 Pullman for those services where if, if you put extra things that somebody has to do on that it will just discourage them from accessing those services that are really critical for them to access because those things are scary to to yeah. to make the decision to go down there and and ask questions about that to begin with and if you start putting extra items on that person's checklist um, it just becomes overwhelming and and not something that uh, at least discouraging enough to some people that they won't follow through on it um, and get get the support that they need Nathan um, well, I, I agree. I, I think part of the crux of the issue is that this, the district court was placed in Pullman or there was an agreement beforehand where if this was a different situation, I, people have just gotten used to the fact that they're going to be in Pullman and this is the, you know, the most populous um, area in the county, whereas in other areas, uh, that that would be a different situation and so they would be traveling regardless and so I think it's just a matter of of the history of the thing and the change is the biggest part now I'm not saying either way on this um, and I, I agree we don't want to create any more impediments but I do think we need to take a long view about the reason that we've gotten used to the fact of, of being in Pullman and providing that access is because it's always been that way and it's not uh, you know it's different in other areas and as far as the question is uh, regarding um, you know whether people were misled I agree completely uh, with Dan with what you said that it's not that people were misled it's just it was an assumption that it would go in that direction so I don't think there was any you know, ill will meant or anything along those lines. I just wanted to respond regarding that. So, and you hear from people from the, you know they're used to on the west side, you know, driving 15 miles to go to court. I mean, that's just normal, or even more than that in some of those areas where they're at. But I, again, 
I, I totally agree with what you're saying here. You, when they're going through a traumatic thing, just going to court in the first place, you don't care to put some more exactly. trauma there. Especially when you look at our college student population and our international student population where right. they don't have ready access to transportation. That, that is something that, that I'm, I'm seriously concerned about um, with people dealing with sexual assault, domestic violence, other, other threats. Um, that we need to make it as easy as possible for people to reach out and, and access the resources that are available. And uh, same with that, as safe as possible. And that's one of the concerns here on this one. So uh, thank you for bringing the information before us tonight. And Ned, thank you so much for giving us a, a way to look at it. <coughs> now we'll just try and figure out a date that we can work uh, together with. Does that that's sound great with you? Sounds fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it be an evening session in lieu of a council meeting, would that be more advantageous than a Saturday? Or Either one or whatever works. Whatever works for everybody. Yeah. Whatever yeah. works. Okay. Anytime. Okay. Anytime. And it'd be great. To, uh, and, and again, we have found the county. Uh, we've had several conversations with them. I have, and, and Adam has, and they're willing to work with us and try to find a resolution to it. I mean, the same thing. We all want to have that service here. Just. How it's going to be covered in terms of costs and how it's going to be handled. So, yeah. All right. Thank you for that. With that, we now have the uh, consent agenda before you. Do I hear a motion to read by title only? Second. Second. Move and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed with that? Laura? Thank you, Mayor. Your consent agenda consists of a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the regular meeting of January 29, 2019, and approve the best submitted. A motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the special meeting of February 6, 2019, and approve the last meeting. A motion approving disbursements represented by account payable checks numbers 94640 through 94886, totaling $1,891,115.35. Payroll checks numbered 741178 through 74285, totaling $94,388.41 and electronic transfers totaling $1,488,979.75, and a motion to accept contract number 17-03, Accelerated Streets Resurfacing 2017, as complete. A motion to accept contract 18-02, Sanitary Sewer Rehab 2018, as complete. A motion to accept contract 18-05, Accelerated Streets Resurfacing 2018, as complete. And a motion to set a public hearing date for Quist annexation. Is there any item the council would like out for discussion? I have one, I think, very quick question on number three, um, the disbursements. Um, so that does need to be pulled okay, out. Okay, we'll pull that right. out. Okay. So that's the only one? So consent agenda consists of items one, two, four, five, six, and seven. Do I hear a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Move and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed with that? Brandon, item number three. Yeah, so I, I just saw this and I was wondering if this was, I, I think it's airport related. Um, whiskey barrel cider, $28,000. Yes, that's airport related. related okay. Yeah. That's all. I didn't we, know if we were, why, yeah, why no. we're helping a business relocate. Now that, we do, but it's airport. FAA money and it's okay. to relocate and it's well, also in the, land, uh, the runway protection zone. Knowing where they were located, yeah. I, okay. So then would you make a motion to approve that? Yeah. Um, item three. Yeah, so. Uh, move to adopt item three of the consent agenda. Second. Move and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we will, and Mike Urban's here is our new finance director. One of the things I've asked for is we have a code that goes right next to it. So you can see it's PUW, some other things like that. So you can tell it's going to go to public works or all that. So, because I mean, that's the same thing. You, you go through and you look at all those and you're saying, yeah. Where does that go for? And I knew whiskey barrel. I was assuming, immediately, but I didn't want to assume. So yeah, that's always a good call. Okay. With that, we now move to the regular agenda. The first item is a resolution and ordinance on Center Street rezone. But before we do that, we have the appearance of fairness questions. And I believe I started with Al the last time, so we're going to start with Brandon this time around, and as we go through all the questions. How do you remember that? Just, it's there. It's there. Does any member of this council have knowledge of having conducted business with either proponents or opponents of this proceeding? Brent? No. 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 
Has any member of this council communicated with any proponent or opponent regarding the proposal that is the subject of this proceeding? No. 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 Does any member of this council have either a financial or personal interest in the outcome of this proceeding? No. 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 Does any member of this council know whether or not their employer has a financial interest in this matter or has an interest in the outcome of this proceeding? No. 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 Number five, does any member of this council live or own property within 300 feet of the area which is subject to this proceeding? No. 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 Does any member of this council have any special knowledge about the substance or merits of this proceeding which would or could cause the council member to prejudge the outcome of this proceeding? No. 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 Is there any member of this council who believes that he or she cannot sit and hear this matter fairly and impartially, both as to the respective positions of the proponents and opponents of this proceeding? No. 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 The last question, is there any member of the audience who, because of the appearance of Fairness Doctrine, wishes to disqualify any member of this council from hearing this matter? And if so, please state the name of the council member and the reason or reasons why you believe the member could be disqualified because of the appearance of Fairness Doctrine. And seeing none, we will now continue. Pete. Thank you, Mayor. This proposal was submitted by the landowner, Tom Fox. The property involved is 19,500 square feet in size. It's located at 115 Southwest Center Street on Sunnyside Hill. The request is to change the zoning of the parcel from R2, low density multifamily residential, to C3, general commercial, and to revise the comprehensive plan map uh, accordingly. Uh, the current use of the property is an automotive service business that we became aware of through a complaint that was filed with our department last year. Uh, staff informed the proprietor that he was not allowed to operate a business in a residential zone. And so he weighed his options, decided to discuss with the property owner the filing of a zone change. And uh, they, uh, with the property owner, they proceeded uh, with the submittal of the zone change application last fall. Um, as stated in our memo, staff acknowledges the applicant's desire to align the zoning with the current and past uses of the site, uh, but we do not believe that this zone change should be approved. As we explained in our memo, there is a consistent pattern of zoning along South Grand Avenue where the boundary between commercial and residential zoning is halfway between Grand Avenue and State Street along the alley there. Uh, this rezone would interrupt that pattern to uh, produce land use impacts on a permanent basis at the same elevation as surrounding residential uses. Um, and that doesn't occur now because of the topographic separation between the businesses below and the residential developments up above. Uh, plus staff does not see a public need to establish commercial zoning at this property when there are other uh, more appropriate places in town for businesses to locate. The Planning Commission held its public hearing on this request on January 23rd. At that session, the property owner and the, uh, and the property owner's agent submitted both testimony and exhibits. That information is included in your packets. In the end, the Planning Commission unanimously agreed with staff that the rezone should be denied. Um, as we've discussed with previous cases, state law does not allow you to take any new evidence, so the action requested of you tonight is to act on the resolution and ordinance before you. The resolution addresses the comprehensive plan map amendment, and the ordinance relates to the zone change, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions of our planning director on this? I, I just, I got so not part of whether we're going to deny or accept this, but we found out that this business was operating there. They're still operating there. Correct. Do we, can I even add, I don't know, do, how are they still operating if it's against city code? Well, <clears throat> we... They're under appeal, apparently. Uh, sort of. Um, we offered them the option of continuing as long as they were moving towards resolution okay. of the issue. Okay. And that was this zone change application. Did you want to add anything to no, that? No, that's, they okay. applied for the rezone. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. Any other questions on this? I think you're all aware of the property. They yeah. have some big signs up there and where you can see the vehicles as you're see going right, right across from the fire station. Yeah. Right, right behind the course. Yeah. Granted? Yeah, no, I, I've seen that. I've driven past that 
So right below that, though, right below this property, those are businesses. That's C3. So what they're asking for is just an extension of that. <coughs> Correct. Okay. Correct. What was the zoning? What was the zoning for uh, the new city hall? We extended off of Grand Avenue for that. What was that? Um, it was uh, R1, and it was changed to C3. Because the other people had a conditional use year. permit. Right. Yeah. The church had a conditional use permit, and the city uh, decided that the council decided that you wanted to pursue a zone change to commercial zone C3. Yeah, I'm, I read through this very, very carefully, and the and the findings of fact and the conclusions, and to, for, for me, this is right on the bubble. And there has been commercial in and out of there for a very long time. Um, the language allows for flexibility in some ways. On the one point here. It says extensions should be three acres or larger whenever feasible. Well, there's some elbow room in there. And the staff response says this is far short of the three acre minimum prescribed. Well, should be and feasible is a long way from prescribed in my, in my semantics. Um, yeah, to me, this one's really right on the bubble. And to assume that nothing has changed in that neighborhood in 40 years, I, I have a tough time getting my head around that. Um, and I just hate the idea of kicking out a business that's that's been there, and uh, and taking that revenue away from that uh, and that landlord as well, who has had, you know, somebody's been getting revenue off of that, the Gormsons or the previous, or the current owners. So boy, I'm, I'm just really right on the right on the bubble on this one. When we're, <coughs> when we're looking at, and maybe this is a question for Laura, <coughs> when we're looking at a zone change though we're really looking at the all the future potential uses for that property as well not just the you know the current proposed use of the, the petitioner so <clears throat> in a situation <clears throat> in a situation like this where we have a, a non-conforming use and we're trying to re, uh, kind of repair that by going through this zone change is this a situation that is more appropriate for a conditional use permit um, than a zone change because if we're looking at the the impact on the area um, with R2 surrounding on on three sides and just the C3 below, uh, I'm wondering if that is a better option than than changing the total permanent usage of this of this property. Yeah, I don't know, is that a consideration we can make? It, we, well, it's the applicant's call. <clears throat> it's, okay. it's the property owner's decision as to how they want to proceed. And. An automotive service business would not be allowed as a conditional use in an R2 zone. So <coughs> zoning code uh, use chart identifies which businesses can be allowed as conditional uses in certain zoning districts, but automotive service is strictly commercial. So the zone change really is their only remedy given the zoning code standards in place at this time. And when you mention the history which is in here in the report, uh, and it was, it was used for basically storing supplies for Gormson's plumbing yes. at one time. And it was also used as overflow parking for guests that went to the apartments which were above Gormson's plumbing. My understanding. And that's the way the thing was used for all those years when Gormson's plumbing was located there before they moved out on Johnson Road. Yes. So. Yeah, that's a, see, that's a good point. There was no, they weren't running their business out no, of that. It, no. was, there was, it was storage. Just because they had a sign on the building. The business was down below on Grant. Correct. That was my and, understanding. Yes. And they've been not there for a long time. Yeah. Um, and these other uses that occurred in that building we didn't know about were against the rules also. Um, I I agree with denying the zone change myself, so It looked like you were just getting ready to say something. No, I, okay. I, I'm with uh, Council Member Sorensen on this, especially if there's, uh, you know, if residents are beginning to complain about, you know, what's what's occurring there and having an auto body, it, it doesn't seem like the best fit for the area. The split, the 
between Grand and then going up the hill. I mean, the alley's not up. right there. It's not ever going to be there, but it is up right next to residential. Yeah. Right next to it, across the street from it. And we've got else. Uh, duplexes and, I, and all that. If we change this to a C3, anything that fits in a C3 could go in there. So we can entertain a motion here. I've heard several sides here, but uh, I, that could be a motion to deny or a motion to challenge or whatever you want. Anybody else have anything? Any other comments? No, I just, so I, I would just say that I'm, I'd be a lot less inclined if this were an island, if they were asking for a piece. I mean, I, I guess I see, I see the similarity of, uh, of punching something up and, and, and around or extending you know, for City Hall, and I, I get three acres. I mean, I think three acres or more has a whole lot more impact on the surrounding neighborhood than something this small. Even though I understand the concerns of anything could go there, and I realize with the City Hall, we did put some conditions on that, um, that it would be for City Hall and, and it was not six for something acres. To, yeah, not for something to come, you know, aside from that. And? If the zoning stays the way it is now, can the owner still use it as a storage facility or would, you, would it have to be something residential? Um, it, would, it would really depend on the type of storage. If, it, if he was storing materials there for the purpose um, of um, uh, supplying uh, materials for the residential aspect of the building next door, that would be fine. I mean, as a residential zone, you couldn't operate it as commercial storage. No, I'm, I'm sorry. But correct. Yes, he could. Be, he could use it for like certain like types garage, of storage. Like an off well, like a garage, like a store, or store RV or units or, in there, and, okay. and, and, and charge so, a monthly rental or something like that. So too, right? Have to do. He could mm. not. Could not do that. No. But he could. He could store his own RV in there. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. But if it's if it's a commercial operation okay. there, then no, cannot, uh, yeah, yeah. could Just not do in that in a residential zone. He had said that it would be a very difficult lot to build something residential on. But they did indicate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, don't, when a business starts in Pullman, don't they have to get some sort of permitting? How is it possible that we, I mean, I as a citizen knew it was there, but I just assumed the city knew. I mean, don't they have to apply to have a business? Or business? They are supposed to. In this case, he um, started operating the business without seeking permission from the city at all. Okay, I see. And so, uh, based on the complaint, then the uh, you don't senior have a building business inspector. License. They go through the state on, on our thing. So. Yes. Right, and even a applying for a business license doesn't trigger any type of review of is your business located appropriately in a zone, properly zoned area. Uh, the state's website does say you as a business owner have the obligation to check what the zoning is for your property to see if you can operate your business there. So that is incumbent upon the property owner to so check. Because it happens at the state level, we, that's why we wouldn't necessarily know about Well, and even if, even if he had gotten the business license, that wouldn't necessarily trigger Pullman to know right. that he was in operating that business in an area um, that it wasn't properly zoned for. You just don't have the right. staff to go through the business licenses and confirm that every single one is properly located. I see. Thank you. Okay. Still. I'm just, I'm just going to say that there was mention in here from the applicant that he wasn't told by the real estate agent that that wasn't zoned there. I have no sympathy for that whatsoever. You, you have to do your own due diligence and in checking into mm -hmm. what the property is zoned before you buy it. That gives no weight to me whatsoever. We also heard something similar with a doggy daycare. Oh, it's just yeah, a same while back. Dog. And incidentally, the new doggy daycare, which is down the road on North Grand, is doing quite well. Mm -hmm. so. that, and that's really a dispute between the property owner and the real estate agent. Correct. Yeah. Not between the yeah, same. That's right. to do with us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, looking for a motion here. I'll move to adopt resolution number R-9-19. Second. Did you read that, Laura? Resolution number R-9-19, a resolution denying the proposal to amend the official comprehensive plan map of the city of Pullman.
from low density residential to commercial for the real estate herein described consisting of approximately 19,500 square feet located at 115 Southwest Center Street on Sunnyside Hill. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. One nay. Any abstentions? We don't count abstentions. Okay, I just want to make sure I got everybody covered. We now move to item number two, the library VR program. <coughs> Motion to approve an amendment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. Has another resolution. Another, on, excuse on me. That was, that was, that was the cop plan. plan. Okay. So do I hear a motion on this ordinance, 19-3. Move to adopt ordinance 19-3. Do I hear a second? Second. Laura, would you read the ordinance for me? Ordinance number 19-3, an ordinance denying the proposal to amend the zone classification from R2 to C3 for the real estate herein described consisting of approximately 19,500 square feet located at 115 Southwest Center Street on Sunnyside Hill. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Two nays. Okay. And I'm still getting used to board docs. Uh, how it's laid out, so yeah. we'll, we'll get there. There was one nay on the first resolution. And, and there was two nays on the ordinance. We okay. appreciate you trying there. <laughs> now we are at item number two, the library. Joanna Bailey. Thank you, Mayor and Council. In early January, the City of Pullman approved an intergovernmental agreement that allowed Neal Public Library to participate in the State Library's Virtual Reality in Libraries project. The amendment before you tonight replaces the content in the compensation section of the original agreement with new content outlining the State Library's reimbursement process for up to $75 of project authorized virtual reality titles. Neal Public Library would purchase the full list of sanctioned VR titles at a total approximate cost of $144. After reimbursement, the net cost of this purchase would be approximately $69. This is a budgeted cost in the library's 2019 budget. So the action requested of you tonight is to approve the amendment to, intergovernmental, to the intergovernmental agreement between the State of Washington Office of the Secretary of State, Washington State Library Division, and the City of Pullman in connection with the library's virtual reality Oculus program. It's a mouthful. I'm happy to take any questions you and might I've have. I've got to hand it to Laura for all the times you had a look at these documents coming from this the state in yes. terms of how many times you had to go through it. So. Finally, passed war on this one. Another amendment. Yes. <laughs> so, comments, questions, and a motion. Nathan? More just a comment, and I know Joanna has heard this, and the council has heard this as well. Um, you're, you're continuing, um, you know, proactive reach towards technology is really very impressive. And as I understand, this is one of the first ones in the state, is that correct? We are a phase two, we're, we're a phase two participant. So there were a handful of libraries as phase one participants. Um, so no, we're not, we're not the, not first, the first, but we are but in yeah. the second wave. Oh, Early adopters. Good. Early yes. adopters, there we go. So with that, Nathan, do you want to make a motion on it? Yeah, move to adopt. Do I hear a second? Second. Laura, would you read the place? It's simply a motion, but a motion to approve amendment number IG 6281-1 to intergovernmental agreement number 1G6281 and authorize the mayor and clerk to execute all documents. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Item number three is dealing with the safer grant. Our newly minted CFO. <laughs> Even have my pen on Chief. Right yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. Thank you, Mayor, Council. So before you is a consideration of submitting an application for a safer grant to the FEMA for the firefighters that were approved and hired coming up in 2020. So you approved firefighters to be hired in 2019, which we hired, and we weren't able to apply for that deadline for that year, but we are able to apply for the ones coming up in 2020. So the Safer Grant opens up and it closes uh, towards the end of March. And what the Safer Grant allows the city to do is to offset 75% of our costs for the first two years and 35% of the costs in the third year. 
So this money has already been allocated. We've already, it's already in the budget to take care of it. But what this grant will do, if successful, it will offset our costs for these three, these two individuals, for the next three years, for just a little over five hundred thousand dollars. It's a little over half a million. It will save the city if it, if it goes through, and we get accepted for it. So no extra cost to the city. It'll just offset the cost and save us five hundred thousand of the eight hundred thousand. So. Okay. Do I hear a motion on this? Or any further discussion? Okay. Sorry. Uh, move to uh, adopt uh, authorizing this grant application. Second. Second. Uh, motion to authorize fire department staff to apply for the 2019 FEMA staffing for adequate fire and emergency response, SAFER, grant to offset the salary and benefit costs of hiring two approved firefighter medics in 2020. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> now we move to a couple of discussion items with the council. The first item is uh, regarding positions on boards and commissions. Adam, I don't know if you want to lead this, sure. but it's the council yeah. makes its decision where they want to be served. So. I, I want to point out uh, an error first. Um, council member Weller reached out to me and uh, informed me the Blue Ribbon Advisory Task Committee is, is for a resident, and that's not a, a okay. council re requirement that it's uh, appointed. So he's he's appointed as as the, the resident for the last twelve or some years. Yeah, yeah and it was it was on a, an old document that had what were the what were the committees and commissions. And at one time we were asking council. Okay, I know like. Police Knowledge Quarter, you've been volunteering on that one too, which is not really a city kind of function, but it's a representative. And uh, we, we have a number of these kinds of committees mm -hmm. that we're doing, in addition to like the three listed here. Yeah. And heck of a lot more on that list. Right. And Pat has a <laughs> huge list. So. And, and Nathan also serves on the uh, RTPO board. Right. So I erred in, erred in how I uh, represented that on the, on the top list. I re received responses from all of you. Thank you for the committees and boards that you were interested in joining, and, and those are listed out in the, the table on page two. Um, so really, I'm just interested in, in knowing who wants to continue, who's looking to change. There are a couple that are um, different from the committees that you currently sit on. And um, with that, I'm allowing you to go ahead and have your discussion. Yes, now. I'll just talk about my things here. I I'd really uh, like to switch or move around or do something and get on the lodging tax committee. I've been talking about that for years and asking about grants and all that type of thing. And I'd, I'd love to move over and do something a little bit different there. Uh, I could go to Suida and that's something that somebody wants me to do and the other one's whatever. You know, I just, I, I do have quite an interest in the lodging tax committee. To do that, I'd have to go off the lodging tax committee. Right. It's only for one cost. And you, we have quite a few new members yeah. with lodging tax committee right now. With, so I sort of like the fact we have somebody with at least has been on it that can help the new members. Because we now have uh, people from Marriott Corporation that are on it. Uh, PJ came on tonight. Um, and we have another one that's uh, relatively new, too, if I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, Marriott yeah. and PJ and well, Brittany is new. Yeah, Brittany is new too. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd still like to go on there, so I'm just putting points in my opinion there. Yeah, and that that was one I had expressed interest, and in. I and Pat had let me know, you know, that uh, about the new people. Um, so I, I was going <clears> to <throat> defer to her on that. I feel good as long as it's somebody who's experienced on council being on that. Um, somebody who's paid attention to the grants. Um, and remembers well, Laura's lecture to him. Laura spends quite a bit of time explaining how this thing works. Lecture. It was a lecture. It was a very good lecture. And I, I use my mom voice, yeah. Okay. This is a training opportunity. Well, you know, in that case, I definitely don't want to be on that one. <laughs> Just throw that out there. They have a complicated charge. Yes, they yeah. do. Well, and I think, uh, so I'll be, I'll be honest, I mean, I think w one of the reasons I looked at that is, you know, quite simply, it, it looks like, you know, in my case, SWEDA, RTPO, it doesn't look like I'm, I'm part of much, right? Uh, and so I'm looking down some of these other committees, and, and some of my, my fellow colleagues here 
have three committees, uh, and so some of the open possibilities simply don't work with my day job. Right. Um, some of them, some of them can. I can mix that around, but some of them are hard appointments that I, you know, hard meetings that I have recurring that I, I just simply can't do some of the committees. So there, there are a finite amount that are open that right now, you know, it makes it almost impossible to get on. So you. Basically, with uh, your day schedule, the suite of which are daytime and the RTP, and that's, on and that's fine when they're you know, yeah, it schedule. works with other things, yeah. Um, I'd like to add something, I'd like to add one at least so, so that I have a couple, you know, in addition to the website, you know, committee, those small, small things that are not standard committees, but yeah, yeah. so maybe. can I? Um, and maybe somebody wants to get rid of offload something. Well, so um, I was probably the only one that Adam contacted and I said, uh, as you can see, open to changes in board membership. And I'll, I'll kind of explain why. I talked about this last time for, I believe, as long as Pat and I have been on, because we've been on the longest now. Um, you know, the tradition has been staying with the board, um, getting your feet wet, having a certain amount of expertise. But as I've, I've been on the council, I think, and especially with so many um, great council members on board, um, it's been very important for myself and my own philosophy to provide space um, for those council members to get their feet wet, understand more, because if you don't provide that space, People, uh, council members can't grow in their professional um, roles. And that's why for myself, um, whatever boards, it's not that I don't like my boards. Actually, I talked to Joanna and I said I'm, I'm very um, protective of my boards. However, the case is that my, my feelings are that the committees come before the individual. And the several of you have expertise and new ideas and new energy that would very much benefit boards and change over um, at a great deal, even if there are new members in the wings and, and waiting. So that's my personal feeling. Things are changing, and we definitely need council members to be able to grow as professionals in these agencies or in these committees that we have traditionally just kind of stayed put. So, thank you. I appreciate that, and I would take the library board if that's one that you had in a heartbeat, because that would work too. With well, there's also know. Palouse Knowledge Corridor. If you're interested in Southeast Washington economic, that's also an entrepreneurial type of thing. But I'm putting that out there, so I'm open to whatever. So I, that, all of my cards are out there for you guys. I, I agree with you, Nate. I think we get settled into some of these committees and we are on them for years and years and years and I think moving people around is a good idea. And that's one of the things that I, I've had quite an interest, as everyone knows here, in the last six years and then even before that when I lost my seat to somebody sitting over there third from the corner. <laughs> um, and, you know, what you know, we could do is that after the, the year with the new people on board and opening up the lodging tax for the next time, the next go around too. I mean, that's another way of getting people trained and ready to go. So, and I, the, I assume you're so, uh, you're solid on solid waste. I am you? solid on solid waste, <laughs> and I want to add the uh, the uh, aquifer committee to that because I think that's a good fit. Be great yeah. Because yeah. The, those two at the present time do not communicate whatsoever. And I think as we move forward and looking at some of the things, especially during the legislature, yeah. this session, that that's, that's, that's the spot for me with that. And then I think I've been on council long enough to have the experience to participate on CIP. And I know, I know, sorry, I, I know Al wants to stay on CIP. So for myself, um, I, you would be a, a great addition to that. So. It sounds like Al's actually open to not to moving it around, just so you know. Okay. Um, so this uh, this is not about lodging tax. This is about any of these these committees. Is I, I guess I would caution that if we were to to base too much on on who all could be on that committee and if they're new, 
mean, we have movement in these all the time. So all of these committees could, could potentially always have somebody new, and then we, we become stagnant that way. Yeah, we have four positions up for election next year. We just had three, three folks join different committees tonight, so. I want you to know by statute I'm definitely on airport board. <laughs> 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 I just want to make sure make sure it's very clear. Nobody said yeah. yeah. It's yeah. also you're the same thing with a joint planning commission. You're in a class of, of your own, so yeah. it's not. So I just want you to know that one. <laughs> Are we <laughs> doing well? Is Sweda just a single Adam? Can we? Yeah. Sweet is just a single. Or all these no. just single? Because I think we had Dan and I both. <clears throat> right, you have you can have two on those. Yeah. Yeah. And Plus Basin Aquifer, we've had two people before in the, that committee, I think. Well, Kevin, you know for sure, because you always go to it. We've had one council member and one or two staff. Okay, that's the way it works. Okay. I know Fritz Hughes did it for a number of years. Mm -hmm. and Barney, and Barney did, did it, it before, before that. that. Yeah. So. And sadly, with lodging tax, that's a statute where the number is so one determined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, ideally, with some of these that are more technical than others, it would ni be nice to be able to have a, you know, a burn-in time where you'd have one. Mm -hmm. Overlapping. Yeah, in an overlapping term, but you can't do that without changing the whole um, designation of the committee. Because if you have, you have so many hotel, motel people, you have so many chamber people, you have, you have so have many recipients, recipients. Money, yeah. and if the number of those changes in any one of those categories, then they all, they all have to change, so, and that's, that's by RCW, isn't it, um, Laura? It, yes, it has to be an equal number of recipients and um, generators, plus one council member who is mandated to be the chair. But but it, it it doesn't specify chamber, like it doesn't say two chamber folks. Well, the chamber Re on recipient. there uh, because Those they're a recipient to of right. Yeah. Well, I have has a record of receiving some of the things I've got in the past. So what is the current makeup of the lodging tax? Who's on it now? It's um, two hotel motel, two recipients. Which are who? Uh, chamber being um, Charlene Jasper and, and it was PJ. Christy Curley and now PJ is coming on for that because as Because uh, they were Lentil involved Festival. as volunteers of the Lentil Festival. So the recipients so of that. Business, is the yeah. To receive. Yeah. And then the elected which would be myself. So just going back to the, the memo from last time, it, it looks like it is a single council member for Sweden and a single council member for um, RTPO. RTPO. And I think we we tried to split one for Suida, one for RTPO. Well, one time they used to meet at the same location. Of they used to rotate and meet in the same location, right? Oh, they okay. used to be at the same Somewhere, location, but yeah. now they've, they, they used, changed. They shared offices. I think they shared similar board makeups, and right. now they've they've since become more separate. But RTPO is pretty important because there's sometimes that they put together a transportation plan and didn't even include some of the things up in Pullman. So. Mayor. Yes. So I've been on the audit committee and I, I enjoy that a lot. And it's a good learning experience. And let me tell you, the people at City Hall, thank you so much for your <laughs> diligence and your excellent work. <laughs> Thank you. They brag about you all the time. Oh, well, and the bullets are always there. And the only reason I, I would like to stay, and it may not make any sense, is just to maybe lend some continuity to our new finance mm -hmm. director. But I certainly <coughs> don't have to. I'm happy to. And then I had expressed interest in the library board just to branch yeah. out and do something different. Yeah. But so those are my two. And I already, yeah, and Ann and I had talked, and I had talked to Joanna and. I think um, I, it'll be a great fit um, for Ann to be a part. So I am absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the audit committee, does, does that normally have two council members on it? Yes. And I see that Eileen doesn't have that on her, on the second page there. I do not have it on the second page there. And I, I have interest in both audit committee and PBAC, but I would I would be happy with, with serving on audit committee. I think I have a lot of perspective on those activities. that. Yeah. Would be beneficial. And, and could go over, you know, you, you could do it at your own time. Some people came in early in the morning. Fritz 
uh, kept bringing in donuts all the time, but that was a different story. But, yeah. I've kind of fallen down on that. that. <laughs> That's great that you would be willing to do that. Brandon, did you say that you can make suite of meetings, or that's difficult? No, no, that's that's fine. That's okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's fine. Getting communications about where and when they are. Is <laughs> we figured that out. <laughs> that's been figured out. So. Okay, so that's been finally taken care of. Okay. Yeah. If it would help, I can just kind of go through the. The list. I mean, I, I just want to make sure that I'm capturing who is on which committee. So, and I won't start with lodging tax because it sounds like that one might be for later. Um, plus knowledge corridor is still one that we need to sort out. So that one is, I, I don't know if it's default the co-chair of the group, but that's what you had been, right? Um, I had been, but uh, it's moved over to WSU okay. as uh, the Washington side. Does it say that we have to have a council member on Polish Knowledge? I don't, I don't know that we have to. It's on our list that it is. I don't think it's been. It says required to be a council member. I think it's been traditionally uh, since Francis was okay. on. Francis started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I, things, yeah, I think you just sort of carried with that a little bit. I don't think, I don't so know. is that an ad hoc position or is I think that it's more ad hoc than anything else because it wasn't, I don't think yeah. it was a council position. I don't think it's a standing committee. Yeah. It's not a committee of the council. No, it's right. not a, so. That clarifies. Yeah. Feedback, I think we're, we're good there. Um, SWAC, we've got um, RTPO is one that is open. That one was one that through the emails I wasn't clear who wanted to be on RTPO. We definitely need somebody there. And those those are not in conjunction with Sweda. Correct. So. Used to be, but no longer. Used to be. You go to our, do you go occasionally, Kevin? I'm on the technical advisory committee of the RTPO, so anytime there we're reviewing grant applications or any of that kind of thing, I participate in that, but I don't it rotates around the whole region, doesn't it? Well I mean it's been down Dayton sometimes. The office is now in Pullman. Um, okay. but I do believe they do rotate around the region. That's correct. And the city would cover expenses as far as mileage is concerned to go to the meeting. That like I'm this. not sure. sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, that's that's one that I had interest in, but it just with uh, scheduling the meetings during the day, right. taking time off work, uh, with yeah. my work schedule, I'm not able to do that. Yeah. I would. I, I think it is an important position because of the upcoming census and what's going to happen after that with the potential change in our status. I think that yeah. could open up new possibilities for us in, in transportation planning for the region. Uh, and so it, it, I think it will be a much more important committee uh, coming in the next decade. That's what I was going to say. Well done, man. I saw one of their publications didn't did mention our airport project, and it was regional transportation. I'm going like, okay, there's there's something wrong here, big time. Yeah. So real quick, Adam, I think we need to have clarification on the Palouse Knowledge Corridor because, um, from what I understand with it being a regional board, we have always had a, a representative from both cities uh, on there um, and representative from the county and then different uh, at WSU and University of Idaho and then um, business. So yeah, I know like chambers were involved. Mm -hmm. did, did that, oh yeah, that, and the did, chambers, of course, okay, Marie has been there. Yeah, yeah I was wondering if that covered the city part. No, no. no there was definitely somebody from city council. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. I think that's because we've invested a right. lot of yeah. money in. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that may be it. It's it. It sounds like it was sort of just the agreement was that as as participating in the, the financial side of it, that there was a, a seat for a council member on, on the board. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that that means it's a requirement necessarily, but it sounds like it's more of a, a It's in our bylaws. Goodwill. I understand. Sure. The Palouse yeah. Knowledge Corps. Yeah, the Palouse Knowledge Corps. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I need to know who the two CIP, so Eileen. Al 
Do you want to continue on CIP? If, if nobody else does, yeah. Um, it just says meets in May, is all this says. So yeah, uh, our official like CIP what expert is yeah. Pete Dickinson. Well, it, meets it meets in May, usually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's right. And there's a, I mean, there's a sizable notebook that you need yeah. to go through um, you do several a hours. weeks ahead of time. So yeah, it's several, yeah, it's several hours. hours before the meeting, and then the meeting lasts an entire afternoon or morning. Um, and then you make your recommendations. <laughs> Yeah, the I think the oh, chair yeah, brings yeah. the donuts. Right? That's right. That, that's what I heard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So oh, yes. Okay. But then the work is done as of May. So you asked me if I want to trade Sweda for for you? Yeah. For CFE. I don't care. You don't care. Either way. <laughs> we do would like to move this along though, so let's uh, see if we can make some decisions here. So if, uh, if Ann would like to to be on library and she and Nathan have worked something out, it sounds oh, like, it's whatever. Um, I don't. then I will do CIP. Um, I actually would look forward to that. And then, um, so Dan. Well, that, that has you for two right now, so. Yeah. Sweet, or what are the two? Yeah, so I, I'm looking at the uh, art. RTPO doing that and dropping Sweda to, to Al. Okay. If Dan, yeah. Okay. As a quarterly, I think that's easy enough for me to, to do. Okay. So Al will be Sweda. Okay. Chapman will do RTPO. CIP and RTPO. Dan's on audit. Okay. And left. And, and, and left. And yeah. Audit. That's on logging time. Yes. But I give you Sweda. So that's my only Christmas gift to you this year. And I heard she'd be open to possible after a year after we get the new people trained. I heard partial. Didn't get quite a con confirmation on it, but that's got a partial on that. For what? That you'd be on lodging tax for at least one more year to, to train people. And then, okay. Might be so we have enough? We I, I'm not covered? sure what I have Nathan on at this point, I guess. Yeah, just gonna say He's it. opening up. I went from a ton yeah. to, yeah, vacation committee. <laughs> vacation committee, no. Um, Social I, chairman. I still think that we have a number of people here that have a lot more on these. <laughs> They're not just All city, of us do. Yeah, yeah. right. All, All right. of us wear a number of different yeah. hats outside of this. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, right now, um, Ann's library board, uh, capital Improvement, Eileen, and RTPO, which I was on, is Brandon, and then Blue Ribbon is, you know, at the county pleasure level. of the county that I'm still there. Um, as far as the, I mean, I can stay on as Palouse Knowledge Corridor, or if somebody else, you know. I would be real comfortable. You, you, you speak so, so well. Yeah. yeah, you speak so well when you represent the Palouse Knowledge Corridor, because mm -hmm. it's something that not a lot of people, unless they read like the community update cover to cover, so, but when you're yeah. out there and they see you and then you can speak to that, and you've done a great job at that. Okay, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are we? Or you have left the board, you're still on, okay. All right. I think Yeah, I think I think we're good. If there's any questions that I have as follow up, I'll get in touch with you individually and just make sure if there's a need to collaborate on something, I can bring it back later. But I think I have enough guidance for where everyone is. I will email you all with what what I think was said here tonight so that you have that and you can correct me if I speak so, so we can all that'll be coming so now moving to item number five that discussion was at about a 20 mile an hour speed limit <laughs> so now we're going to be talking about that <laughs> with like Kevin that's a sort of a transition look how we got it done yeah, that's right so uh, thank you mayor uh, public work staff was asked to research the procedure for evaluating a change in the speed limit on East Main Street within the city's central business district the request was to outline the process uh, to go from the current limit of 25 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. Uh, because East Main Street is part of the state highway system, the requirements are laid out in RCW, and there are basically two steps. 
perform an engineering and traffic investigation um, and assuming the investigation justifies a change in speed limit to then submit the results of the investigation to WASHDOT for approval by the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, an engineering and traffic investigation would analyze the speed most motorists drive as well as accidents, parking practices, bicycle and pedestrian activity and uh, any other special factors. We look for examples within the state of Washington where uh, WASHDOT has approved a 20 mile per hour speed limit on a state highway in a downtown central business district setting and we're able, unable to find any examples. We heard a number of times that yes, there's somebody in the southwest part of Washington that's done this, but uh, the only thing we could find was a bridge that had a 20 mile per hour speed limit on it. Not to say there aren't any, but we weren't able to find any um, leading up to this meeting. Um, we were able to find examples of 20 mile per hour speed limits in downtown areas such as the Hilliard area in uh, Spokane and the historic district of, or historic downtown of Port Townsend, uh, but neither of these are on state highways. Um, and so we're not sure how the, the local agency justified those lower speed limits or what type of engineering investigation they did. Uh, in evaluating the studies that we could find, um, and I listed a couple examples just based on an internet search, um, it appears that a signs only scheme would have minimal, minimal effect on average speed without active speed limit enforcement by the police department or installation of traffic calming measures. Um, and the theory behind that is people drive the speed that the road feels comfortable at. Um, and if you artificially lower the speed below that, um, people will drive what they feel comfortable with for the most part. Um, traffic calming measures are things such as bulb outs, chicanes, speed humps. Studies do show that pedestrian fatalities and serious injury are reduced at slower uh, vehicle speeds. Uh, because the city is proceeding with work on the central business uh, district master plan that may include traffic calming, staff suggests waiting until that process is a little further along before proceeding with sp potential speed limit changes so the two efforts can be coordinated. Uh, due to present workload and expertise required for this work, uh, staff requested a scope and budget from a traffic engineering consultant that we've used in the past just to give you an idea of what it might cost and what the effort might look like. So I figured somebody would ask, you know, what would that cost? At this time, staff is requesting input and direction, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions, comments, Al? Yeah, I, I've paid attention to this quite a little bit and things, and then, um, I know that we are working on the Central Business District uh, consultant, and, and that is going to be part of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to work on traffic flow, calming measures, and all that type of thing. And we're moving forward with that pretty quickly right now. And uh, I agree with the recommendation from Public Works that uh, I think spending $13,000 to do study downtown and think about changing the speed limit from 25 to 20 when we might be doing something completely different just a little bit further down the road. It doesn't make sense to me to make changes or spend money doing something where we're going we're gonna to have the same information put out shortly down the road again. So I would, uh, in my opinion, think that uh, uh, doing a study, going through all that type of thing is, is not well thought out planned in my opinion it's not that far it's not like we're waiting five years to do something this is happening yeah Brandon. yeah so um yeah i'll chime in because i think i, I helped get the ball rolling on this um, and i know i had emailed adam asking how do we push the ball across the goal line because i know downtown pullman association was was big on this a lot of the downtown businesses we had set as our priority downtown and and that meant the policies that came with that. Um, and so I, I feel pretty strongly that in, in all my research about downtown revitalization, um, you know, urban revitalization, uh, the, the 20 mile an hour is a good model because we need to look at all forms of transportation. The whole public transportation network needs to include pedestrians and needs to include bicycles. Um, but I also agree that I have, I mean, I have a number of concerns with the, um, with the report that we received, the, the example that we might get from, you know, from the engineer with, 
with how they would go about pedestrian counts and where they would count pedestrians and at what time of the day they would count those. And um, I would like to see if we're, we're going to spend that kind of money uh, to have that in as part of our downtown master plan because that is an individual who I think would understand from more than just a vehicle perspective um, what we need to do to, to revitalize. Um, I may be wrong, but I, I know DOT had given me a couple instances of, of cities that had changed speeds, um, one of which was the City of Republic, 2008. Um, and, and maybe it wasn't 25 to 20, but they did mention Palouse did change the speed limit on a state highway um, because it's 27 through there. So, so it, it can be done, and I'm sure they did it through the same process, which said based on an engineer's estimate. Um, you know, however we feel about that. Uh, but I, I think that the, whoever we contract with, whoever whoever wins that bid for us, would be somebody who would be knowledgeable in examining all of this. Um, and I would much rather spend the hundred thousand dollars that we have budgeted for that to include, you know, some of this from a much more holistic perspective than, than just vehicle traffic. Because what we're trying to do here downtown is not just examine the speed and slow cars up, it's the movement of, of everybody, including people, and to not prioritize one over the other because we're getting really neat reports back from you know some of the, the architecture and engineering classes, talk about things, everything from noise pollution to, to all kinds of things, and that's not going to be um, Part of I think this thirteen thousand yeah. dollar you know report. So, so I wholeheartedly agree with Al. Um, I want to see this move to twenty miles an hour, but I realize that there's a process to go through. So I'd rather it be embodied in this in this larger thing that we're going to spend the money on. Even though I want it now, <laughs> I, I'm willing to wait to do it right. Yeah, and I don't I don't know if we need it to go to twenty or not. I'm not yeah. one way or the other. I'm just saying, I think from the meeting I was in today that this is part of something we're already going to be paying for, so we're going to be paying for it twice. Right. Yeah, this definitely gets the cart before the horse. And we need the holistic approach and because we're looking at making real changes in the character of our downtown. And another traffic study doesn't move that, doesn't move that ball forward at all. A traffic study is just a traffic study. We, we know that that's what these people do, and but just to count cars and count 85th percentiles or whatever doesn't doesn't get us to our walking downtown that we want. And our discussion today included pedestrian, everything you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, that's right. So I mean, we talked about pedestrians, and all kinds of bicycles. Yeah, but uh, so. you know, you look at the what are we basing it off of, like the 85th percentile? I mean, it's based off of the current engineering that we have, right? And and the downtown master plan, they would include potential. Uh, engineering changes, right? And I think that's important because that will affect speed. You know, the whole, I mean, the whole thing. Could and, and if we have features like, you know, like uh, green spaces and, and that sort of thing, and then the walk all ways for one thing, we wouldn't want 25 mile an hour, I don't think, in a walk all ways. <laughs> yeah. That just that just wouldn't work. So should we get some of those perks that have been brought up by the community, something is going to have to happen but just to count cars at this point in time. And, and we've been chastised, and rightfully so, I think, for being too car-centric and not bringing this to the fore. And like I say, these people have done good work for us in the past. We just don't need them right now. We also saw some changes like when WSU went to 20, and they've got some good justification on Stadium Way and when you have so many pedestrians crossing. Yep. But they also had 20 in a larger portion of Fairway, which they have revised yes. and went back to 25. Right which is like by the courtyard and places like yeah. that. At one time, that was a 20 mile an hour zone. They changed that. I remember when there were no signs out yeah, there. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> um, Nathan. So, um, Brandon, was this brought up by citizens or by yourself? I mean, where, where did yeah, so where did it begin? Yeah, so I know I can tell you um, this was something I brought up during our goal setting retreat. And I don't know if you were there at that point or not. Um, but it has, it has consistently come up as one of the, the options um, that some of the business owners as part of Downtown Pullman Association um, have brought up. And, you know, if you're looking at common best, like best practice right now in some of our 
uh, urban planning, yeah, this is this is definitely one of those items. This is not the only item, um, but but all this revitalization, um, you know, is is embodied in, in a number of things, and, and speed is one of those. So walkability is um, is huge. I, I strongly recommend the book Walkable City. I've actually yeah. read it through my master's, so yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, so so I you know that that's that's just one good example, but. Um, you know that that's something that's a recurring theme is is how do we feel safe and we've received you would have received the same emails from some of the residents that have said you know that they they don't necessarily feel like it's a, it's as walkable as it could be downtown so um, you know a lot of that is crossing Main Street yeah and but it's not, more and more people that. living downtown we yeah. this some we absolutely have to done you know put in place in and, and so Steve Austin's uh, class that came in and presented at the downtown Pullman Association mm -hmm. they talked uh, a lot about noise pollution and yeah. they had ways that they measured that including vehicles that you know the, the noise pollution they give off at one speed versus the other it's, it's pretty astounding well I, I appreciate this um, I've learned a lot it you know this was something in um, when I took a class on economic modeling that the slower speeds, people take more time to look around at the different businesses, and it actually shows an uptick in percentage of customers in downtown business. So I find it really interesting. I do appreciate the multimodal. That's that's definitely. I mean, as we've discussed, um, very important um, uh, for downtown. But this is very interesting. But I also agree we we do need to look at the. Yeah whole downtown as it goes but no, I agree. interesting point yeah, very interesting well and I think we need to be a, a little futuristic as well in terms of what are we going to what is going to happen to Main Street yeah. right now we know that is part of the state highway system but we'd love to get that traffic mm -hmm. off of there mm -hmm. and that's going to be dependent upon the <laughs> south bypass and and moving that kind of traffic mm -hmm. and so a lot of that really has to do with the character of downtown mm -hmm. yes. especially depending on um, the time of year too I mean people can't sit out in front of a business and enjoy a coffee or enjoy a beer or a glass of wine or whatever and not have the trucks come roaring through and just kind of decimate all of that ambiance so I think there are a lot of um, different pieces mm -hmm. that have to fit into place here it's not just the speed issue it's it's everything mm -hmm. and, and when we look at different design elements as we've experimented with a little bit with the charrette in terms of like you say creating spaces for people to spend money <laughs> which is a good thing with screening and vegetation those create different site distances and site issues with traffic so all of that has to be taken into consideration w rather than just you know stand somebody with a stopwatch or you know ticking ticking off time and well i just have a concern about commerce traffic at this time slowing it down that much and actually adding to our congestion problems in downtown yeah. potentially so i i just i agree i don't feel like it's the right time to take the action right now but I do think it's definitely worth considering oh, in the future. Absolutely but there are a lot of pieces, a lot of pieces. to it. Yeah. Um, I agree I don't think it's the right time I think we should be part of the, the more comprehensive planning process but in, in terms of you know something you said Kevin about uh, Southwest Washington thinking that there so you've heard that there may be some place down there. Uh, I think not, not specifically with the speed limit change because I don't think they did this but Aberdeen Washington with the the U.S. highways uh, that go yeah. through there, they have a similar situation as we have with two one ways, both on the highway system that go through downtown Aberdeen. And I know that uh, probably five to seven years ago, they made some significant changes down there um, based on city council recommendations. And there was a public backlash at the time. Um, I think there was a lot. Of, it was kind of the town divided on whether or not that was a good thing that they did or not. So I think we should really take a look at that as a case study of of what were the citizens' concerns there, what did they change, and what was the out, out, outcry afterwards. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right, so I think you've got a pretty good opinion here yep, from I do. everybody. Thank you. Take a breath. Save, save money and <laughs> keep working with your other project. So. All right, with that, uh, is there any new business to come before the council tonight? 
seeing none, you can see ahead of time what the other agenda is for the future meetings. With that, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Move and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.